A note to the listeners, episode 74 contains some explicit language and mature themes. Word nerd. Wordsmith. Wordy. Wordless. Oxford Dictionary says a word is a single, distinct, meaningful element of speech or writing, used with others or sometimes alone. We say each one matters. No extra words is literature, minimalist style. And we're getting you right to the story. Healing Time by Paul Beckman The news wasn't good, my father told me over the phone, and then he hung up. I called my sister in Cleveland and told her that news wasn't good. And when she began to ask specific questions, I said to her, I'm sorry, I don't know, and hung up. She called my brother, who lived four doors down from me. But since we didn't speak, she told him I had called and said the news wasn't good. He asked her to explain, and she told him that she couldn't. That's all she knew. He's siding with our brother, he said, and hung up. Next, my brother, who wasn't speaking to me, called my mother's hospital room, but no one answered the phone. I put on my hoodie and kids and drove to the hospital, but my mother had left instructions that her sons were not allowed in their room. So I called my sister in Cleveland and told her that if we want to know anything, she'd have to come out and talk to our mother, since us guys weren't allowed in the room. The next day, I picked up my Cleveland sister from the airport and drove her straight to the hospital. On the way to my mother's room, we came head to head with our father, who hadn't spoken to his daughter, my sister, since he caught her going down on her boyfriend in her sophomore year in high school. My sister stayed in my mother's room for hours while I sat outside and my father sat in the waiting room talking to my neighbor brother, who didn't speak to me. Finally, I couldn't stand it any longer, so I walked into the waiting room where the vending machines were and bought myself a payday and a Dr. Pepper. My brother walked out, and I sat next to my father and ate my lunch when my brother neighbor took my seat outside my mother's hospital room. After a while, my sister and my brother walked into the waiting room and stood blocking the door so neither my father nor I could leave. She said that Mom was gone and at peace. We asked her what she and Mom talked about for all those hours, and she said that Mom had asked her to keep the conversation confidential as long as we had family members not speaking to each other. My sister and my neighbor brother walked into the waiting room and closed the door behind them. They took seats and my sister began and said to her father that she forgives him for not speaking to her and bears no ill feelings. And she hopes that he'll come to Cleveland and meet her husband and kids. He shot her a look and got up and walked out of the room. I began to say something to my brother neighbor. And he held up his hand and said, don't bother, and left. And then it was me and my sister from Cleveland, alone in the room. And we'd always spoken. So I asked her what Mom had said, since we're the only ones speaking, and tried to talk to her father and my brother neighbor. She told me that as much as she wanted to tell me, because there was information that I'd like to know and should know, She'd have to live up to her promise and not say anything until all of us were talking. I took my last bite of payday and walked out, leaving her to find her own way back to the airport in Cleveland. Sue Bell's Homecoming by Helen Grockmall Sue Bell got out of the taxi, home from her awful cruise. The driver pushed and dragged her extra-large suitcase to her door and finally dropped it hard in front of her cottage in the senior community. Giving him a spiteful look, Sue Bell ordered him to put it inside as she unlocked her door. "'You had better give me a big tip, lady.' 
After the driver had pushed the suitcase to the other side of her door, she answered, "'You'll get nothing from me. You have been rude.' Not that she ever tipped anyway. The man left, cursing under his breath. Sue Bell locked the door and sat on her favorite chair in a huff. She nodded off, not being a spring chicken, as people said in her day. Waking in a few hours, Sue Bell thought of the things she needed in her suitcase, like her prescriptions. She went toward her front door, stopping as she saw a big red stain spreading on her carpet from under the dark case. She was flummoxed. Nothing wet and red was in her suitcase, at least not as she had packed it. Then she noticed its address label was not hers. She bent over to see the name Egbert Sykes and a phone number on the label. She froze. She remembered that awful man whose last words to her were, I could kill you. All that nonsense just for her refusing to sit at his table. Sue Bell was sure the floozy at his table was not his wife, and had told him so loudly, everyone staring, as the waiter had tried to seat her at their table. She had wondered for a minute why she had not been seated at her assigned table. She thought that the only reason could be that the lecherous Mr. Sykes had paid the waiter for her company. His rabid denials had only shown his real character to the whole room. So Sue Bell called the cruise line, and was told that the gentleman in question had already called, and was on his way to her home to exchange the suitcases. "'No, no!' yelled Sue Bell. "'He will kill me. Why did you give him my address? I'll sue you for the whole cruise line when they find my body.' "'Madam, Mr. Sykes said your address and phone number were on your suitcase. In your own handwriting, I presume?' Sue Bell called the police, whom she first berated for taking so long to answer the phone as usual, and for not arresting the paper boy who had cheated her on a nickel, and had then refused her the delivery service she was entitled to as a citizen.' "'We closed that hot case,' said the deadpan voice on the other end. "'What do you want now?' "'An evil man who was traveling with a woman who was not his wife is coming to my apartment. "'He said he could kill me when I saw him last.' "'Look, sis, call us when he actually kills you,' was the officer's answer to her. "'We'll have a block party.' "'Sue Bell was now terrified, knowing no help was coming from anywhere. "'After checking her door and putting a chair under the doorknob, "'Sue Bell ran to her bathroom and crouched in her bathtub, "'covering her head with a quilt she had grabbed from her bed on the way. "'This is what they said to do in an emergency. "'At least the emergency weather channel had said it once. "'She did not know what else to do. "'Sue Bell heard a loud knocking on her door, "'strong enough to break it down, "'sending the chair under the doorknob flying across the room. "'The wood splintered.' She wondered if the red stains from the suitcase would make footprints on her clean carpet from the shoes of the man coming toward the bathtub. Hello there, welcome to No Extra Words, the flash fiction podcast. My name is Chris baker Dersh. I'm your producer and editor. We have an absolutely jam-packed show. I have so many things I want to talk about, and as usual, I have this running clock in my head that wants to get you back to the fiction, which is, of course, why you're here. We started off today with Paul Beckman, who has been a repeat contributor to the show. Paul, I was a fan of Paul's before I ever had a show, so it always thrills me to see Paul's name on a contributor list and a submissions file. And right not too long after I got... Paul's submission and had it scheduled is when my father got sick and was in the hospital, which regular listeners know that's a thing that happened. Dad's doing great, by the way. He keeps getting better every day. But it was hilarious because I swear Paul's story could be called My Family's Communication. My dad always says we put the fun in dysfunctional. Um, I think a lot of families are like that. My father's family is a little more stable. My mother's family is the one where you have to play that game of telephone, who's speaking to who and who's not speaking to who at any given moment. And... What I love about that story is mom in the story in her very last moment is using the, the best bullet in her gun, basically, to make this family all come together and talk. It was eerily familiar and told in the way that only Paul could tell it. So we go from that cast of characters to Helen Grockmall's Sue Bell's homecoming. Helen Grockmall, fellow librarian. Shout out to the librarians among us. Sue Bell is that kind of character that everybody's met. Everybody knows a Sue Bell. Everybody's seen a Sue Bell, and she, God love her. Sue Bell is the one where if you lived in the South, you would want to end everything you said about Sue Bell with the phrase, bless her heart, and it would not be good. So that's kind of what today's show is about. It's about these characters who, 
life just isn't as good for them as it maybe once was. And that might be their fault, or it might just be the way the world turns. And they're all pretty short today, which is fun because it means I get to squeeze in four of them. So we're ending with two more stories about romance or maybe even we just call it dating as time goes on and we become more disenchanted with the universe. Before we do that, though, I have a new segment to the show. I think I'm going to think of 2017 as the year of new segments. This is the year that we threw (laughs) new things into the show that may or may not come back again. But this segment will be back because, oh my gosh, guys, I can't even tell you how exciting this has been. I don't have a jingle for it. I feel like I need to pull out my guitar and do jingles for these new segments. If anybody out there has some spare time and wants to write me up some jingles, send them to me. I would love to throw them in the show. I'll give you every credit you could possibly imagine. But I'm calling this one Writing Spaces. I love to know where people write. Maybe it's jealousy. Maybe it's the fact that my own office has been in this half-formed flux since August, probably. (laughs) And so I don't have the space that I want to have right now. I'm talking to you from an uncomfortable chair with a microphone in the wrong place and a fluorescent light because I don't have a place to plug in my floor lamp right now. So... I'm jealous, maybe, or, you know, maybe it's the author in me who read Virginia Woolf's A Room of One's Own or something. But there's something in me that always wants to know where everyone else is doing their writing. And when I see people out in the wild writing, there's a great indie bookstore not very far from my house called Third Place Books. And third place, if you're unfamiliar with the concept, your first place is where you live. Your second place is where you work. And so the idea is that everybody needs this third space, this place that isn't your home or work, that is some kind of community that brings you out in the world, whether that's your church or community center or whatever it is. So third place books, the founder of third place books, that's the idea is that third place books will be this space. So the bookstore is built around this big commons area that just has tables everywhere and a food court with really good local yummy stuff. And so people come together to play chess and have club meetings and there's no charge. It's just a wide open common space and people write there all the time. And I love to spy on them. And I love to bring my typewriter and spy on them because then people are spying on me too. And so when I see writers in the wild anywhere, Starbucks, as I mentioned, I'm a librarian. So I hang out in libraries a lot. So in the library, wherever people are, and I always imagine writer spaces in people's homes too, like cubbies under the eaves. You know, I have this fictional character that I've been working on for, I don't even know how long. She's never going to appear anywhere. She's just one of those people that kind of lives in my head. And she has little window seats in her house that are kind of just set up. So any floor she's on, she can duck in and just sit and write and look out at big trees. Inspired by that, I asked the list of past No Extra Words contributors to let us know where they're writing, to send a picture and themselves talking about whatever that space looks like. And I thought I'd get half a dozen, and I'd pick two or three of that half a dozen to share with you all. And you guys, I was blown away. I sat down and listened to these all in one evening and then slept, and you wouldn't even imagine the writer dreams that I had. I'm not going to spoil for you by telling you what we got, because my goal is to bring all of these to you in future editions of writing spaces. But suffice it to say, wow. I'm just going to leave it at wow. And so in our first ever writing spaces segment, I'm bringing you Sarah Mitchell Jackson and Edith Gallagher Boyd. And the reason I liked how they fit into this episode is for them, their writing spaces are evolving as families evolve and as needs evolve. And I think that is a common thing, the longing for the space you once had and yet learning to embrace the space you do have as your phases in life change. And it matched really well with these stories. So Sarah Mitchell Jackson, longtime friend of the show. She was actually interviewed back on special episode five as part of our Contributor Appreciation Month. First appeared with us back on episode 39, which I think was last March. I'll put it in the show notes. Edith Gallagher Boyd was with us last summer in episode 54. So both of these ladies are going to come on and share with you their writing spaces. And if you want to see pictures, this is not a visual medium, but if you want to see pictures anywhere you're listening to this, 
you'll have a link to show notes. So if you're in iTunes, it'll be right there. If you're in whatever podcast app you listen to, usually there's a little information button and you click and it will tell you more about this episode. If you're listening on our website, they're right there. There'll be links to the photos. So you can just click right from wherever you're listening on photos if you want to see what the spaces look like that they're talking about. So Four stories today, plus two writers telling you about their writing spaces, really means that I need to get out of the way and let that happen. So coming up next, writing spaces, and then we will end with our two short stories by Tom Young and Fred D. White. And I will see you guys in a couple of weeks here on No Extra Words. Spoiler alert, more writing spaces is coming. My writing space is one of the three bedrooms on the top floor of our townhouse. I call it a library because I've always wanted one and also because it has four bookcases double shelved with books. I'm actually not allowed to buy any more real books until we get some more shelving. That does mean Kindle ones are okay. There'll be more on that in a bit. Here in my writing space I have a very comfortable armchair with an ottoman that matches. I would like to say that I use this for relaxing and reading but the reality is that I hardly ever get to sit there. One day, though, one day, I have big plans, you see. Slowly, I am buying the best of everything for my writing space. I have a lamp made of glass, which looks like a tulip drooping. I have a wonderful printer, which no longer works wirelessly since we changed our internet provider, and I still haven't found time to investigate that and fix the problem. But it's still a wonderful fast printer nonetheless. I actually wish it didn't spew pages out across the floor or stack them when it stacks them in the opposite order but you can't really have everything. And when you have a library or a writing space at all, you can count yourself very lucky, and I do. I have a very small desk. It dates from the time when I lived in an apartment that I still wanted to seem luxuriously large, so I was careful about the furniture I bought. On this desk, I have a laptop and two glass coasters and nothing else. The surface of my desk must be kept free of clutter if my brain is to work properly. I have an open laptop policy in my library. If she is always open. Yes, she's female, and yes, I have named her. There is a greater chance I'll be able to use her. This is not a superstition. It's a fact. I'm probably going to lose this space. I'm almost certainly going to swap my beautiful library for the small room next door so that my sons can have a larger bedroom to share. If they share, I can still have a room to write in. If they don't share, there'll be nowhere for me to go, and I'm not quite sure what will happen to all of my books. This brings us back to the shelving. We probably won't buy any more, because if we did, it wouldn't fit into the nursery, in inverted commas. That means I'm not allowed to buy any more real books until we move house, whenever that might be. But let's stick with the glass being half full. I'm one of the lucky ones. I have a space that is mine, configured the way I want it, that I can write in. I have a desk and a laptop and a printer. I have four bookcases stacked with books. And aside from the cued reading material of about eight paperbacks, I have read them all. My desk is under the window and I can look out across our back garden and the gardens that back onto ours and watch as my neighbour's blossom-laden tree taps lightly against the wood cladding of her house. I can watch the skies roll past me like watercolour backgrounds, subtly changing and inspiring me to place one word after another until I've written what I want to in the way that I want to. It is all this which makes me the writer I am. The nook, the alcove, the hole in the wall. My writing space. I was born under the sign of cancer, and my family has always been my raison d'etre. Multicolored photos of the family who reared me and the family I married into hang on the wall near me. There are collages which span decades. A picture of my husband when the Marlins won the World Series and countless action photos of our son surfing small waves in Florida and mammoth ones in Hawaii. To the far left is an old-fashioned Rolodex, still useful to me for the addresses not yet put into my iPhone. To the right of the Rolodex is my iPad and little black keyboard. 
the portable device I use to write my stories. Sprinkled among the family photos on my new brown desk is a square marble relic of my years working for the American Red Cross. Slightly to my right is a black and white photo of the water tower near my childhood home in Philly, which hasn't produced water for over a century. This photo is important to me as I spent countless childhood hours playing basketball with friends at the recreation center behind it. The nook the alcove, the hole in the wall, is new to me, and I feared it at first. My former office in the home we recently sold faced a large window, swaying Florida palm trees, and a spectacular blue sky. But I've embraced my nook, my alcove, my hole in the wall, and merely need to take a few steps to our balcony to see Florida pines, maples, palm trees, and blue sky. My nook has less clutter than I would like as it is open and adjacent to our living room, but I allow myself random supermarket receipts, crossword puzzles, and writer's magazines. I'm happy here. I write here. I feel snug and fulfilled tapping on my little keyboard, hoping to turn words into magic. If you'd like to learn more about my work, please visit me at edithgallagherboyd.com. Stay away. By Tom Young. She took a train from Memphis with her sister, but her sister got off somewhere in Montana. Her sister is a big Robert Redford fan and wanted to see where they filmed Jeremiah Johnson. If you haven't seen the movie, it's about a wilderness man that sets off to make it on his own after leaving the war with Mexico. The whole movie is a series of Indian attacks and meeting strange people along the way, like the grizzly bear hunter, crazy widow, guy buried up to his neck in sand, the squaw that gets sold into marriage, she marries Redford, and the kid that never says anything. It is one of my father's favorite movies, and probably came out before you were born. It came out before I was born, but that never stops me from watching it if I happen to randomly come across it on Turner Classic Movies. That's how the best things in life are. You just happen to randomly stumble upon the things that bring some kind of excitement, or rekindle the fire that was once there. When you feel like kissing the stars again. You know, all that shit. Anyways, that's how I met the one from Memphis, and her name was Amber. I mean, her name still is Amber. At least I think it is. Unless she changed it, or she lied about her name in the first place. I'm guessing the latter, and the whole bit about her sister getting off somewhere in Montana seems like bullshit, too. But that's not really important to anything, except, like I mentioned, I enjoy a good movie now and then, especially westerns. I saw her step off the train. What got me first was her raven black hair and emerald green eyes that made her stand out in a crowd of mediocrity. Like, once you saw her, nothing else would ever matter again. I waved, and she saw me right away. She smiled and brushed her hair behind her left ear like everything was part of a routine for some talk show or late-night phone sex ad. I knew that the whole thing had been a mistake before she even arrived, but I wanted to live again, and if that meant meeting a random woman at a train stop in Dallas, then all the better— I walked over to her and grabbed her suitcase like a gentleman should, and we walked slowly to my car in the parking garage. I left the old Ford parked in a handicapped spot, even though I had no affliction besides myself. We didn't say a word the whole drive back to my place, but I noticed Amber seemed to like the music on the radio. She moved her head to the beat and often snapped her fingers like every tune was her favorite, or was the last song ever to be played on earth. I didn't even know any of the songs, but they seemed to be the most popular hits on one of those music mix channels that only played the top 40 overweight housewives jammed out to applauding the murder of their husbands. Once at my place, we got drunk on Arbor Mist wine-flavored beverages and smoked unfiltered cigarettes in my bed. We still didn't say anything, because I never liked to spark the conversation if she wasn't going to talk, then I wasn't going to act like I was interested in getting to know her. I knew she would be gone in two days, and that I would never see her again. When a woman travels across the country to meet you, her disappointment has already arrived many times before. Love is a ghost, and it's been forgotten many times. All you have to do is look in their eyes. We laughed one time for no reason at all, and then I held her close. 
I got lost in everything, but caught myself before feeling anything that mattered. It wasn't going to work. Sometimes things have a way of never working out, especially if you see them on the silver screen and already know the ending. Autumn by Fred D. White The maitre d' seated me at a table two rows across from a woman who was sitting by herself. He handed me a leather-bound menu, one of the reasons I loved this place. Mellow jazz was playing, another reason. It sounded like the blind George Shearing on piano, whom I had seen perform live with my ex years ago in another life. A waiter promptly approached, "'Would I care for a refreshing bottle of Perrier?' "'No, thank you. Tap is fine. "'And please bring me a vodka martini up with a twist, not an olive.' "'Absolutely, sir.' He bowed slightly and left. I studied the menu, even though I knew what I wanted, and looked at the woman. Except for one fleeting glance at me, she sat stone-faced, staring at the entrance. Her reddish shag-cut hair made me think of Shirley MacLaine, She was wearing a dark green silk blouse and gold earrings. I guessed her age to be mid-fifties. Any moment now, a tall man in a hand-tailored suit, someone like me twenty years ago, would appear. She would wave, and he would walk toward her, kiss her on the mouth, no, on the back of her outstretched hand, and sit down across from her. Beaming, she would lean forward to hear what he had to say. And if he were I, he'd have so much to say. The waiter returned with my martini, a glass of water, and a basket of bread. I ordered the porterhouse, medium rare. Excellent choice, sir, our chef's specialty. He bowed again, took the menu, and darted away. The woman reached into her purse for some tissue and wiped her eyes. Suddenly our eyes met, and I looked away reflexively, wishing I hadn't done that. When I looked back, she was rummaging through her handbag again. I got up to use the restroom. Before I headed back, I combed my hair, what little was left of it, and adjusted my tie, wishing I had picked a better suit to wear. I walked past her, heart pounding, hoping she would make eye contact with me. This time, I would not look away. But she did not look up. In fact, she seemed to be making a concerted effort not to look at me. I suddenly felt as though past and present were swirling together, becoming indistinguishable. I wanted badly to say good evening to her but she would have to look up at me first. A fleeting glance would do, but that did not happen. I returned to my table. A moment later, the maitre d' seated a couple at a table between me and the woman. I could still see her, but only partially. My hope for an autumnal romance was fading. I drank my martini, ordered another, and when the waiter returned with it, he handed me a folded slip of paper. Thanks for listening to the No Extra Words podcast. For more information on today's stories and contributors, or to learn how to submit your own work, please visit us at noextrawords.wordpress.com. The best support you can give the show is to recommend us to your family and friends. See you next time.